Welcome to Atmospheric Tales, a podcast that amplifies stories and experiences related to air pollution and climate change from around the world. I am your host Shahzad Ghani. Welcome to another episode of Atmospheric Tales. Our guest today is an associate professor of environmental politics at the Department of International Strategic Studies, University of Malaya. Her areas of expertise include transboundary haze governance in Southeast Asia and global palm oil politics. She has almost two decades of experience in qualitative research, conducting fieldwork, interviews, and focus groups among various government and non-government stakeholders, and has built up extensive research networks in countries across ASEAN. She has published, edited, and produced several books and reports for international agencies. I'm excited to have our guest, Dr. Helena Warki. Our interview today is Maggie Chell Gioe, is a research fellow from the Institute of Climate Change from the National University of Malaysia, also known as UKM. Her field of expertise includes weather prediction and air quality modeling using numerical methods. She has worked closely with the government bodies to fill in the weather and air quality science gaps in tropical Malaysia. She has actively published peer-reviewed papers and featured in magazines and newspapers. Welcome to the show, Helena and Maggie. Thank you, Strazat. And I would like to welcome Dr. Helena. Transboundary haze has been a recurring problem in Southeast Asia, especially during the months of August to October, when the region is relatively dry. In the case of strong, hot and dry weather anomalies, ENSO, which is El Nino Southern Oscillations, the burning becomes more intense and sustains much longer, emitting a large amount of haze. For instance, according to the Met Malaysia in mid-June, the probability of ENSO conditions to strengthen by the end of the year is over 90%. Apart from that, Singapore Institute of International Affairs has also issued first ever red alert for transboundary haze in 2023 on 20th of June, which means this year there's a high possibility that it will be a burning year for Southeast Asia. And quoting from them, heat wave this year will be a stress test for cooperations between government and the private sector. In the past episode, we had a discussion with Prof. Puji Lestari about transboundary haze in Southeast Asia, addressing especially the role of peat fires as an important source of regional air pollution. We understand transboundary haze is a complex and multifaceted issue as well as it is not new. This burning problem has been around for quite some time, since the 1990s. What are the main challenges of combating this transboundary haze as we understand this country affected by the haze are not the main contributor by the haze? Yeah, so definitely there's a lot more than just the physical or the biological problem of haze. One reason why we still have transboundary haze in this region, uh, it started to become an issue about 1980s, and we're still facing it today, is because of that transboundary factor that you've highlighted. So the fact that countries uh, like Indonesia, which is the main source of the haze, of course, Indonesians are the ones who suffer the most because those who are closest to the fires uh, will be the one who are suffering the most in terms of health and other effects. But the issue is then, when the haze crosses over borders. So it reaches usually countries like Singapore and Malaysia in the region, and sometimes even Brunei and beyond uh, Thailand. And this is where it gets a bit complicated because if we look at the drivers of haze, which I believe uh, Prof. Puji would have touched on, is a lot to do with land use change in Indonesia, a certain extent in Malaysia as well. And if we look at Indonesia, a lot of this land use change uh, is linked to sectors like palm oil and pulp and paper. And when we look even more closely, the companies which are involved in this are not only Indonesian companies, they are international companies, international investors, and often from places like Malaysia or Singapore. So it becomes a very sensitive diplomatic issue where the source of haze is coming from one country, but the actual drivers are multidimensional, multi-sectoral, as well as multinational as well. So um, what we always see uh, when there is haze, first of all, there will be this sort of question of whose fault is it? It becomes sort of a finger-pointing issue when countries complain about the haze or when countries say that, you know, something should be done. Indonesia, for example, will find it sometimes a bit 
you know, being made a victim when countries like Malaysia or, or, or Singapore say that, you know, Indonesia, why don't you do something about the haze? And this is when it starts like, oh, why are you getting angry at us? Uh, you know, because it's your companies which are also involved on the ground in Indonesia. So this makes it a very difficult diplomatic situation to resolve before you can actually reach the stage where you're actually doing something about the case, where, uh, the stage where assistance is offered, the stage where capacity improvements are done, cooperation on a regional level. So the very first stage of actually talking about the problem is already a very sensitive diplomatic issue. So I think this has been part of it. Uh, every, every year when we have haze, these diplomatic sensitivities come to, come to the fore. And this very much complicates the actual action and mitigation activities uh, which are surrounding haze. And the other thing that's also related to this, the fact that haze is multinational in that sense, where sometimes you would have companies which are headquartered in Singapore or in Malaysia identified as, you know, having a hand in on the ground, the underground situation, it becomes a question of who is accountable for monitoring, who is accountable for enforcing. Perhaps a headquarters which are in, in a country far away, it is very difficult for them to know what's going on on the ground or very difficult for them to actually have a good handle on what's going on. Of course, they are responsible for their subsidiaries, but how does that work in actuality that this is something that is not so easy? And when you have Indonesian authorities, for example, to what extent are they able to enforce you know, uh, regulations on foreign companies. Of course, you it, it may be straightforward, but not always. So all these kind of challenges do come up when we face such a transboundary issue. So I think I'll pause there for now. Yeah. Then uh, from your sharing, uh, transboundary haze in its nature, it is a bit tricky because it's a regional issue. What do you think such regional cooperative entities such as like ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asia Nations can help to mediate this condition, Dr. Helena? Yeah, so ASEAN has played a very big role actually for, on haze. ASEAN since the 1980s have already identified haze as a regional issue, not a national issue because it does affect quite a big chunk of the ASEAN countries. So there has been a lot of activities, a lot of agreements uh, that ASEAN has put together, which is impressive in itself because ASEAN, you know, is uh, very much known for its ASEAN way approach, which is a bit like arm's length approach, uh, non-confrontational, non-interference uh, policies. But for his, they've kind of tried to move beyond that. So we have technically legally binding agreement with the ASEAN Transboundary Haze Pollution Agreement. But however... Of course, at the early stage, we did realize that the agreement is not that strong. Uh, it's been identified as toothless by quite a few scholars in the region. But what ASEAN has done is that they've tried to operationalize this agreement further over the years. So, for example, there was the roadmap that was enforced in the last decade. And that roadmap was meant to operationalize certain things in the agreement. And there has been some successes but some areas are not fully operationalized yet. And I think these are the opportunity areas that ASEAN can really focus on as they are moving forward. So in the past or up to date, ASEAN has been really helpful in sharing information about the haze. So, you know, we have the ASEAN Specialized Meteorological Center based in Singapore, which is a very important body for coordinating information sharing, alerts on haze, um, all this has been very helpful across the region so that at least countries are more prepared to face the haze. Uh, however, there are certain things that ASEAN is still working on. So uh, things like there was supposed to be a transboundary haze pollution centre, a dedicated centre to coordinate haze cooperation, uh, supposed to be in Indonesia, but currently it has not been put to fruition yet. Currently, it's still housed under the Environment Division of ASEAN, which also deals with a lot of other things, so it's not ideal. So these are some of the directions that, you know, further regional cooperation can do well with. Um, another thing that I think is really potentially very useful for ASEAN to look into is the importance of standardized indicators. So as we know, haze is a regional, multi-country issue 
And when you have multi-countries, you also have multiple ways of measuring his, of reporting his. Uh, so this is what is faced with in ASEAN right now. So for example, for air quality indicators, we don't have a standard indicator yet. The air quality figure in Johor Bahru, which is in Malaysia, can differ from what is in Singapore, which is just very nearby, because of the different uh, ways of calculating air quality. And this will affect, of course, the way information is processed, the way the, the problem is understood, and various other things as well. So um, this is something that can be standardized at the ASEAN level, and this hopefully uh, will be able to translate to more accurate monitoring, more accurate accountability, as, and also enforcement at the international or at the regional level at least. So this is what ASEAN has been doing, and I think this is perhaps a few uh, directions that ASEAN can move forward on this issue. It is quite um, glad to hear about some of this effort that has been done for um, ASEAN and also uh, hope that the Transboundary Haze Pollution Centre uh, could really bring some lights on the um, haze issue. And commonly known uh, that this slash and burn practice in the agricultural sector is one of the main cause of this uh, transboundary haze problem. And the palm oil industry is one of the main followers of such practice. And it has also received enormous international pressure on the sustainability of its production. Looking at the bright side, is this pressure changing how the palm oil industry in uh, Malaysia and Indonesia operate for now, uh, doctor? Well, this is an example of a very sensitive issue actually in this sector. So actually slash and burn is something that is very normal in this part of the world as part of the agricultural landscape. And in the past, there was a lot of link between slash and burn and haze. But we have now understood a bit more that actually slash and burn practices if it happens outside of peatland areas, is not such a big problem. And actually, slash and burn practices, which are done by most of the smallholders, don't very often occur in peatland areas. So this is actually perhaps the significance of slash and burn has been amplified in the past, but now we are having a bit of a better understanding of how to understand things on the ground. So indeed, there has been a lot of link to palm oil industry. And one of the good things of this attention that has been put on the palm oil industry because of his is that there definitely has been changes of practices on the ground. So in the past, definitely there has been activity. I wouldn't say slash and burn, so to speak, because slash and burn is usually related to sort of small-scale agriculture, but it's more about land clearing in preparation for plantations. So in the past, this has been quite commonplace, where if you are on peatlands, the, the land would be cleared and perhaps the timber sold for, uh, you know, as timber. And this would be used as startup capital to, to start the, the plantation. And what would happen then is sometimes uh, as a cheap and, and efficient and quick way to prepare the land because you need clear land to, to plant would be to burn. And uh, this was the practice in the past. But uh, because there's been so much attention, the big players have definitely you know, moved away from this practice because they know that um, it's really hard to defend uh, this practice. Uh, there are alternative ways that are more environmentally friendly, less risky. And definitely we have seen a move away from these practices among palm oil industry, among the pulp and paper industry. Of course, I, I cannot say for sure that it completely does not happen anymore, but definitely the regularity of this has reduced. And this is a good thing because of this attention. But, you know, the challenges still remain is that peatlands are a very sensitive uh, landscape. And the fact that these plantations are still on the peatlands, uh, this makes it continuously a, a risk of fire. So plantations need to continuously take care of their water levels, have to continuously be aware if things are getting too dry. They need to have standby fire brigades. So it, it's a constant challenge of managing the risk in this landscape. And, you know, when you have uh, communities living nearby, there might be some risk of uh, fires that would occur and this would spread, you know. Sometimes there would even be issues of land uh, grabbing, which communities may use arson as a way to show their dissatisfaction for this land grab, which they feel that, you know, is a, it is violating their rights. Um, so all of these uh, risk factors still exist when you have palm oil plantations or pulp and paper plantations on peatland. So this is the challenge that, that still exists. 
And these kind of things are the ones that more likely are to cause fires, disturbed areas of peatlands, more so than the actual lighting a match and, you know, causing a fire. I see. So resonating to that, there is actually several certifications that were developed um, to assure the customer and consumer that the palm oil production is, after all, sustainable. Uh, for example, there are roundtable on sustainable palm oil, what we call RSPO, and also the Indonesia Sustainable Palm Oil ISPO certifications. There are some similar certifications as well. But can you comment on how helpful are such similar uh, certifications? And actually, how effective are these certifications to really ensure the sustainability of the palm oil plantation and its production? And after all, are, are these certifications cost effective? Yeah, so the certifications that you mentioned, of course, are really a big deal in the industry right now. And I would say that RSPO, which kind of came first, uh, was really helpful in sort of highlighting that palm oil can actually be produced sustainably. And these are what you have to do to produce it sustainably, you know, for the, for the industry. This was really helpful in getting the industry to care about changing their practices, especially the high profile companies, the large companies, the multinationals, because they have become so visible because of the haze problem, because of deforestation and stuff like this. They are so visible. And there is a need for them to show the public that they are making changes and they are becoming more sustainable. So subscribing to things like RSPO has been a very useful way for companies to show that they are doing something and also for them to have the motivation to change their practices. So for example, under RSPO, they have regulations about you know zero burning, about plantations on peat. So this has been very helpful in sort of moving away from the more risky activities. Of course, RSPO by nature is, is a round table process where their principles and criteria are improved and, and refined over the years. So there's this continuous improvement process. So perhaps in the future, we'll have even more uh, principles and criteria that can address those kind of other uh, landscape problems or, or challenges that I mentioned earlier. For ISPO and MSPO, these are jurisdictional uh, standards. So they are introduced by the countries, by Malaysia, by Indonesia, and they are in accordance with law. So they are not really going above and beyond. They are just trying to make sure that all the players are meeting the minimum requirements. So these are useful for like our smallholders or the medium players who may not have as much visibility, so they don't have that consumer pressure like the large companies who, you know, need to have the RSPO because consumers demand it. But they are those, and they are also those who may have less funds to pay lots of money to an auditor, for example, to come and certify them under RSPO. So they can have this option of subscribing to ISPO and MSPO. And this is sort of what we call lifting the floor while RSPO is lifting the ceiling. So they have been able to help these small and medium players to at least improve basic practices. Of course, if you compare RSPO and ISPO and MSPO, ISPO and MSPO's requirements are, are a bit lower and they are a bit easier because they are aimed at, like I said, lifting the ceiling. But over time, hopefully this will improve as well. So for example, for MSPO, you know, how they deal with plantations on peat. Currently, it's still a bit vague but hopefully it will, it will improve over time. So uh, this is what I can say about these various sustainability, whether they are effective, whether they are cost effective. I think as a whole, they have been very useful in trying to maybe address this misperception that palm oil is automatically unsustainable and also push the sector towards more sustainable practices, either in leaps or in baby steps. There are different approaches, but at least the movement has been there through all of these measures. So the guidance from um, these certifications actually helped this company um, to fulfill the sustainable uh, palm oil production and plantations, while um, the responsible management practices of agricultural land actually uh, mainly come from the culture of the company itself, um, as well as the small planters. Uh, we know that awareness and education are the main important turning point for the transboundary haze problem as well. And uh, we do know that your team has been uh, diligently working on advocacy of bite-sized uh, climate education. Can you tell us more about it? 
Yeah, so this is sort of another project uh, that, that me and my colleagues, uh, we had worked on. We developed a website, which is Bite Size Climate Action. And our idea for this website is to make accessible knowledge about climate change to Malaysians so that to empower them to be able to take their own steps for climate action. So the idea was that, you know, in Malaysia, a lot of us may not be able to relate to things like polar bears and icebergs melting. And this is what usually the conversation about climate change is all about in the international level. So we thought, let's make it Malaysian. Let's make our case studies, our data Malaysian. And let's make it bite-sized so that it's really small. Somebody can just sit down for half an hour and do one module. And, and of course, it's free to get a better understanding about what they can do. And one of these modules is actually on forests. So we have like on energy, on forests, on waste, on water. Uh, we have altogether seven modules. And one of it, as I mentioned, is on forest. And we talk there about, you know, peatlands and what you can do about certification, how to look for certifications, how to understand labels on your products, how to be a good consumer. And I think this is our small part in trying to educate the, especially the youth. And uh, one thing that we are really uh, happy about is that we've been able to actually get a few universities to adopt it as part of their elective courses. So like my university, the uh, University of Malaya, as well as my colleague's university, uh, University of Nottingham. Uh, we offer it as elective courses so students can also take it as part of their education. They can have, you know, a line in their transcript that they have some knowledge about climate action. And hopefully this will even open up opportunities for them to work in the climate sector in the future. So this is what we've been doing with Bite Size. If people would like to check it out, um, it's online. You just have to Google it. It's interesting to know that it's free and actually it's suitable for the university students. So it's mainly catered for the undergraduate or grad school? It's, it would be catered for all levels. So we actually have a section where we talk about how to adapt the contents all the way from primary school all the way to university and both for science students and non-science students as well. So of course, we try to make it very simple, very fun, very interactive, but as accessible as possible. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, perhaps maybe one day I could adopt that in UKM as well. So uh, apart from the transboundary haze issue, uh, we have seen also actively involved in climate change research work and recently uh, methane emissions has been a highlight in Malaysia industry, especially with the reportings required uh, for the UNFCCC. So uh, what shall we know about methane and who needs to be aware of it in Malaysia? Yeah, so methane is something that is quite new on the radar of people uh, recently. So the idea being when people talk about climate change, they always talk about CO2, right, carbon dioxide. But then we kind of forget about the other greenhouse gases. And methane is one of them. And actually methane is much more potent than CO2. So methane is actually one of the key gases that will help if you address methane to address climate change in the short run, which will buy us more time to address the other greenhouse gases in the long run. So it's really important for this sort of immediate 10 to 20 years. And Malaysia has recently signed up for the Global Methane Pledge, and along with many other countries. And what we are interested in this research uh, that you rightly mentioned we are looking at is to see how Malaysia can sort of uh, adapt its commitments and its policies to ensure that we can play our part to fulfill the Global Methane Pledge. In Malaysia, the two biggest industries that are uh, producing methane is oil and gas and palm oil. And these two industries are our super important industries. They are our key cornerstone industries of Malaysia. So it, it, it really means a lot, you know, that our main industries are also the main methane producers. We can look at it as an opportunity. We can make big action and it can be effective in a very short time. But, you know, the challenge here is actually quantification and reporting. You know, a lot of times uh, we don't really know how much methane is being released, where it's being released, and we don't know how to quantify the actions that we are taking. So these are the kind of things that we are looking into, the challenges that Malaysia has, and also the opportunities in terms of methane for the country. Our project is about six months in, so we, we are still maybe early days, but we hope to be able to make a bit more impact as, as time goes by. Looking forward to see some of the outcome from the project. Uh, the Climate Change Advisory Panel uh, 2023 is formed in Malaysia by the Ministry of National Resources, Environment and Climate Change. 
and we have found that uh, you have been recently appointed to this uh, advisory panel. Can you explain to us what is the direction and the role played by this advisory panel, uh, particularly by yourself as well, uh, to move the climate change agenda forward? Yeah, so actually this appointment was just very recent, so it's still early days. And actually, it's not me personally, uh, it's actually University Malaya, which has been appointed along with a few other local universities. So USM is also on it and uh, UTM as well. So uh, I think the role that we will play as academics is to highlight to the ministry, you know, what kind of research we are doing in the context of climate change. So for example, me as part of this UM group, uh, you know, one of the, int- the areas of interest will, of course, be things like methane, things like peatland use, land use change. Uh, so this is important for us to be able to communicate to the ministry. And also one of the main roles, as we understand it right now, of this advisory panel is to advise the ministry on what we see as priority areas for negotiations at COP28. So as the process goes along, we hope that, you know, we'll be able to really guide that process a bit. I'm not sure to what extent, you know, hopefully uh, the ministry will, will take on board lah, what, we, what we are hoping to share. Yeah, it, it's, it's really uh, good to see that the, there is such advisory panel form and we're really looking at the Malaysia government trying to take serious actions towards it to help to reduce the climate change effect or impact in Malaysia. Throughout the interview, uh, we have feel a lot of passions from um, your interview, your personal blog and your sharing sessions uh, with the general public. Can you tell us more, like what inspired your interest in this topic that you have been like working on it for quite some time and then still being like passionate on it? Yeah, so um, my background is international relations. So that is, uh, you know, my training. But I was always not so much interested in sort of the hard politics issues of, you know, geopolitics and uh, war and peace, this kind of stuff. So when I was thinking about, you know, what I should focus my research on, something international, something transboundary, something ASEAN, his was the thing that came to mind because it was a big, it was a very prominent part of my childhood and I'm sure of yours as well. You know, Malaysian children born in the 1990s, 1980s. This was something that disrupted our school. You know, if you had, like, for example, my sibling has asthma, so there was, you know, hospital trips involved and all this. It was a big part of our collective memory. So I chose to focus on that. And as I studied this case further, uh, you know, it brought me to things like the palm oil, a global palm oil politics. And it, it really was very clear to me that this is something extremely important to the region not only in terms of the environment, but also in terms of economy and the future and development and people. So it, it was interconnected in so many ways. And that's what really got me uh, really very dedicated to learning more about this problem. And um, that has been my area for the past 15, 20 years. And from there, uh, it really cultivated an interest, uh, you know, in sort of like scholar activism, climate change, climate action. And I have seen many of my students coming in into international relations with similar interests in, uh, you know, environmental politics and diplomacy. And this has also inspired me much more. And I think this is also my role to play, to inspire students and to encourage students in this direction as well. So I'm really happy to play this role and also hopefully inspire others to to move towards this direction in thinking about environment, not just from the side of science, but also from the side of governance, policy, diplomacy. And yeah, and I foresee that I will be doing this as long as I can. Thank you so much. It's really inspiring when the, we listen to your sharing as well. You are so knowledgeable. And then um, on the work that you have done, the book that I've published, actually, it really makes a big difference. Uh, for us in the ASEAN region to understand the matter of transboundary haze, um, not only on the physical side, but actually on the grassroots and actual how does people dealing with it, why does it happen? A lot of them are actually on the social side. So I'm really glad to have uh, Dr. Helena together with us for the interview today. Thank you so much, Dr. Helena. Thank you so much, Maggie. Thank you. With that, I would like to thank our guest, Dr. Helena Warki, and our interviewer, Maggie chel for joining us on this episode of Atmospheric Tales. Thanks to all our listeners for tuning in. Make sure to subscribe and share.